I'm not sure how many of you are tuned in a little early, but I'm glad you're with me. And I'm just going to go over some of the things in my notes quietly to myself for a couple of seconds, and we'll go live. Uh, we are live, but we'll I'll kind of start the teaching in about three or four minutes. So get settled in. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Michelle, hope you're doing okay. Glad you're with me. Gonna start in a couple of minutes. Just hang in there. Uh, those of you who might be watching via the Wilshire Boulevard Temple page or the Truly page or the Truly Espanol page, um, if you would switch to my Facebook page, there's a, a tag, a link on all the posts that we put up about this. If you will switch over to my Facebook page, you'll be able to type in comments, and that way we'll be able to be sure to address some of the things that might be on on your mind. So please switch over if you're on uh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple's Facebook page, Truly or Truly Espanol. Uh, let's switch over now to at Rabbi Steve Leader. Uh, the easiest way is just to use the hyperlink that was added to each post on my Instagram. Um, so welcome. Uh, Abby, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, Ah, uh, Nicole, glad you're here too. So glad. Welcome. Hi, Dana. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes. I know we said we'd start right at two, but there are people on three or four different uh, Facebook pages. And uh, I just want them to have a chance to log in too. Hey, Judy. Glad you're here. All the way from Oklahoma City. Ruthie, welcome. Hey, Susan, so glad you joined us. Uh, let me say again, for all of you who are watching on the Wilshire Boulevard Temple page or watching on the Truly or Truly Espanol pages, if you want to comment and uh, give me a chance to answer your questions, switch over now to my Facebook page, at Rabbi Steve Leader. There was a hyperlink in all of the uh, posts about this this Facebook Live event. So follow, click on the hyperlink or come over to at Rabbi Steve Leader uh, Facebook page. And that way you'll be able to ask questions and we'll be able to have a real conversation about this. Kelly, welcome. Glad you're with us. Uh, and I'm going to give it just a couple more minutes. I would say it's 202 at 204 I'm going to really start the teaching and and we're going to really dig into this very important topic uh, which is what is there an ancient wisdom that can help us during a seemingly and I want to stress seemingly unprecedented time but really humanity humankind has a lot of experience with fear with plagues uh, with the interconnected nature of human life and how we have to take care of each other. 
Uh, so we have a lot to talk about. There's a lot I want to share. I just want to give a, another minute or two for everybody to join in. Again, uh, for all of you who are watching on Wilshire Boulevard Temple's Facebook page, Truly or Truly Espanol, uh, if you want to make comments or ask questions, switch over to my page, at Steve Leader. Um, you can just do a search for Steve Leader. You can click on the hyperlink that was part of the posts about this Facebook Live event, uh, the posts on Instagram, and then you'll be able to join us and we can really get to, uh, you know, answer your questions and have a conversation. Uh, Jill, glad you're here. Andy, hope you're watching too. Freda, thanks for everything you're doing. Glad you're with us. Lori from St. Louis Park. Hey, Lori, my hometown. Uh, Margaret, Susan, Abby, so glad you're all with us and with me, and we're together in this way. Um, just another couple of seconds, and then I'm going to start uh, start teaching and and pointing us to some sources that I think will really be helpful as we all navigate this seemingly, and I stress seemingly unprecedented situation. Um, of course, if it's a first, it's unprecedented, and it's a first for many of us, but it's not not a first for humankind, that's for sure. So we're gonna we're gonna dig into that uh, in just a couple minutes. Sally, welcome from Fort Wayne, Indiana. My wife's from Marion, Indiana, just about I think about 45 minutes away or less from Fort Wayne. So I married a Hoosier. Glad you're glad you're with me. Oh, Carolyn, hey, welcome. So glad you're a part of this. Again, a final uh, reminder for those of you watching on Wilshire Boulevard Temple's page, watching on the Truly page, and watching on Truly Espanol. If you'd like to comment uh, or ask a question, you need to switch over to my Facebook page, at Rabbi Steve Leader. Uh, you can just search my name, or you can use the hyperlink that we provided in the postings about the Facebook, this Facebook Live event. So. Go ahead and switch over, and I'm going to start. Merle, glad you're with us. Thank you, Merle. Hope you guys are okay. Hope all of you who are part of this are okay. Yeah, Ruthie. Ruthie is uh, writing, my father survived the Holocaust, so I learned about survival. We're going to talk a little bit about some lessons from the Holocaust that are applicable to now. Dana, welcome. Hope you guys are okay. Uh, Emma, love you. Glad you're with us. Wish you could wish you could sing for us right now. Okay, I think uh, it's two o six, so it's time time to start. Uh, I will do my best to look at comments. And hey, Maureen, thank you and thank you for helping me make this happen. You're the best. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start now and I'm going to do my best to move and and keep looking occasionally at your comments and questions and see if we can address them as well. Um I thought we might approach this a little bit chronologically. And by that I mean why don't we start at the beginning? What do we know from the Bible? And I I know we have many of my evangelical friends listening right now, many of my Jewish friends listening right now. We have people from all all of the uh, the entire spectrum of religious belief, um, from the most liberal to the most fundamentalist, and I'm going to try and talk about things that really apply to all of us, uh, lessons we can all learn. So let's begin, first of all, with some observations about plagues in the Bible. Uh, if those of you have a Bible with you, or if you want to write this down and look it up later, the most similar thing I can think of in the Bible to our current circumstance right now is the uh, way the Bible treated people who were afflicted with a disease called Mitzora. Uh, it's often translated as leprosy, but we know for a fact it wasn't leprosy uh, because the symptoms described are very different than leprosy. But nevertheless, it was, it was definitely a kind of um, skin affliction that was believed to be highly contagious, a communicable disease. 
So if you go to Leviticus chapter 12 through chapter 15, you don't have to do it now. You can look this up later or just take my word for it. If you, if you look at how that plague, that affliction, uh, this terrible skin disease that was believed to be so contagious was, was treated back then, I think it has a lot to teach, of us, teach us. First of all, when a person contracted this illness, the community did isolate this person. This person went into quarantine. And by the way, so interestingly to me, uh, they were quarantined for up to 14 days, which indicates to me that our ancestors knew a lot about communicable disease. But in any case, they were set in Hebrew, outside of the camp, but they were not abandoned and they, they were not left alone. The priest, who of course was the religious functionary, the spiritual leader and the physician of the community back then, visited this person regularly to check on him or to check on her and see how they were doing and see if they were improving. Now, if after 14 days they were improved, they were welcomed back into the community. But here's the most powerful lesson from this entire little segment of the Bible. The Israelites stayed put when a member of the community was isolated. They stayed camped where they were. They didn't move on. They didn't leave anyone behind. And that, I think, is the lesson for modernity. We don't leave people who are afflicted behind. We do all have to isolate, to separate. But that is a very different thing than abandonment. And I can tell you from my many, many years of working with people who are ill, it is the feeling of abandonment that is the worst kind of suffering and the worst kind of pain. So this to me is a biblical mandate to all of us that while we may have to isolate, we must never abandon. Reach out, find ways, multiple ways, multiple times a day to reach out to people who are isolated people who are ill, people who are suffering. We can't show up physically, but we can show up in so, so many other ways. Uh, and so we, we take a lesson now from our biblical ancestors. We stay in camp and we don't just move on uh, past people who are suffering and leave them behind. Uh, Jill, welcome, I'm glad you're with us. I want to pause now just to remind people one more time who are watching on the Temple's Facebook page or Truly or Truly uh, Espanol to move on over to at Steve Leader. Um, I'm sorry, at Rabbi Steve Leader, which is my Facebook page, if you want to comment uh, or ask a question. So you can do that by clicking on the hyperlink uh, from the posting or just Google Steve Leader and it'll, it'll eventually lead you to my Facebook page. Um, and thank you again to everyone. Gail, welcome. So glad all of you are a part of this. So uh, again, we're talking about leprosy and how it was treated and the way in which the community did not abandon the afflicted. I wanna move on to another, I think, very important, very interesting part of the Bible that has a lot to teach us about something we all need to learn in this coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and that is the way the Bible understood that many things are both good and bad. They have the potential for good. They have the potential for evil, which in essence means they're neutral. And they depend almost entirely on how we choose to make use of them. This is called a tikkun uh, in the Bible. Tikkun, oh, that's Betsy and Rosie. <laughs> See, life goes on, which is so beautiful. Uh, so this is called a tikkun in the Bible, a repair, uh, an improvement, a change. So let me explain what a tikkun is, because I think this is one of the most powerful ideas in the entire Bible. Let's take, for example, uh, gold. In one instance in the Bible, gold is used to fashion a golden calf, an idol. The, Moses is late coming down from... Mount Sinai, the people are frantic, they're leaderless, they're lost. I think that's exactly how a lot of us feel right now. We just feel frantic and lost and who's in charge and what are we gonna do? 
And when this happened to the ancient Israelites, <clears throat> they create this, this golden calf. They use gold to create this false god, this idol, and they have this sort of dizzying pagan ceremony around it. They lose their faith, and it leads to chaos and panic. Now, right after that in the Bible, our ancestors create the, the tabernacle, this beautiful, magnificent sanctuary to God that they carry with them through their wanderings in the desert. And guess what part of it is made of? Gold. In fact, the holiest part of it, the holy of holies, is made of gold inside and out. Now, this may seem insignificant. To me, it's a very powerful lesson. One week, gold is, in one instance, gold is used to create a golden calf. In, the, in another instance, it's used to create a magnificent sanctuary to God, which means gold is neutral. It's how we choose to make use of it that's important. I'll give you another example. Um, if those of you have Bibles with you, and if you don't, you can just write this down and look later. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, it's the uh, scene in the Bible where God casts Adam and Eve out of Eden, out of paradise. And then the gates of paradise are locked. And in front of them, and I'm quoting now, God stationed cherubim, these, these angel-like creatures with wings. God stationed cherubim to the east of the gate of Eden with, a flaming, with flaming swords to guard the gate. In other words, these cherubim, these, these angel-like creatures are used to keep us out of paradise. They're used to keep us away. Now, if you go forward, if you go forward in the Bible, and you go to Exodus chapter 37, verses 6 through 9, let me read this to you. Actually, I'm... I'm so God made a cover uh, of pure gold to, an, an, to cover this beautiful ark. Two cherubim of gold. He put one at one end, one at the other end. These cherubim had their wings spread out, shielding the cover, the cover of the tabernacle with their wings. They faced each other, facing each other, turning toward the cover. Now, so now we have an example of cherubim using being used to to protect something holy and to welcome us in this was all done in this place called the tent of meeting so in one case you have these cherubim used to keep us out in another you have them used to welcome us in same cherubim same metaphor same image another example in the bible of something being positive and negative it depends entirely on how it's used rain is like that in the bible rain nourishes the earth can also cause a flood the sun can warm us, the sun can burn us. Nuclear science created nuclear medicine, the MRI, the CAT scan, and it also creates weapons of mass destruction. So there are many things that are neither good nor bad. They depend entirely on how we choose to use them. And I think that's also a powerful message from the Bible about us, our behavior, our attitude, our approach. To this quarantine and to this virus. We can use this as an opportunity to demonstrate tremendous compassion and love, or we can use it to be fearful. We can use it to be uh, mistrusting of others. We can use it to hoard, or we can use it to give. We can use it to give, or we can use it to take. We can use it to love, or we can use it to hate. This is entirely up to us. And so, my my hope, and I think the challenge of, of tradition, of the sages, of the ancients, is for us to take what is essentially neutral and find within it the opportunity for the good. And I am not for a moment trying to idealize this virus, idealize suffering. I'm not for a moment trying to say that this is good, that any of the good things that are going to come out of this are worth it. They're not worth people dying. None of it's worth people dying. I'm not here to pretend pain is a good thing. Pain is pain and suffering is suffering and it's awful. What I am saying is that while none of what we can gain from this is worth it, neither is it worthless. 
if we've got to walk through hell, let's not come out empty-handed. And, and that's a lesson that goes all the way back from the beginning. And these very fundamental religious ideas, things like loving your neighbor as yourself, things like not doing unto others what is hurtful to you, things like always watching out for the widow, the stranger, the orphan, the oppressed, in other words, the powerless in our society. And this is pulling our society, stratifying our society. That these mandates to care still matter. And in fact, matter as much or more now than they ever have before. Uh, I think it's also important that we talk a little bit. Well, let me just take a moment to welcome a few more people. Um, Richard, welcome. Glad you're here. Debbie, Nina. Hi, Nina from New York. Oh, so glad you're with us, Nina. Lisa, glad you're here. Sally, uh, Janet, thanks. Thanks for uh, telling me you love my book. I'm going to say a little bit about that book uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, again, a reminder, those of you who are watching on Wilshire Boulevard Temple's page, Truly or Truly Espanol, if you want to comment or ask questions, migrate over to my page at Rabbi Steve Leader, uh, or just click on the hyperlink on the postings. I'm going to move forward now, moving from what the Bible, some of what the Bible has to teach us about how to behave in, in these challenging moments, uh, to the question of prayer. What is the role of prayer in a circumstance like the one in which we find ourselves right now? Uh, and I think, first of all, let's talk about the language, the actual word and meaning of prayer. I, I've said this before. I don't think it can be said enough. The English word prayer comes from a Latin word, precari, which means to beg. It's the same root as the word precarious by the way, which means, you know, uncertain, unsure, something's precarious. And it, it all revolves around the idea of begging God to subvert the natural order of nature, to bend the arc of nature in our favor. Um, it posits a God as some kind of omnipotent, omniscient grantor of wishes for individuals. I have never understood prayer this way, uh, and neither, by the way, do the ancient rabbis. Um, I think it's it's hard to see prayer as God being some cosmic grantor of wishes because so many uh, people who do pray to God to subvert the natural order of nature for them uh, are sadly disappointed. If God was in the business of granting wishes, this virus would be gone. If God was in the business of granting wishes, all of our lives in the world would look very, very different. I don't see any evidence to support the idea that God is in the business of granting the wishes of individuals. Now, that being said, then, what is the role of prayer? Why pray if our prayers aren't, quote, answered? And here, I think, now let's move to the Hebrew word for prayer and the, the ancient Jewish understanding of prayer, which I think has something to say to all people everywhere, not just Jews. The Hebrew word for prayer is tefillah. It comes from the verb lehit palel. Now, for those of you who are grammar nerds, lehit palel, to pray, is a reflexive verb in Hebrew. It's, it's reflexive means it's an action that one does to oneself. The Hebrew word tefillah, the Hebrew word for prayer, means to turn inward, to be introspective to ask not what God can change, but what we can change. Prayer is not meant to manipulate God. Prayer is meant to change us, the person who is praying. Uh, and that is a very different understanding than asking God to, you know, somehow uh, create miracles on our behalf. Uh, I'll give you a beautiful example from a 17th century rabbi that I think puts it pretty well. This rabbi uh, was watching a fisherman on a lake uh, on his boat, and the boat was tethered to the shore with a very, very long rope. And he saw the fisherman, you know, pulling, pulling the boat to shore. And the rabbi said, 
if you knew nothing about physics, if you knew nothing about the way in which the world works, let's say you landed from another planet and we're watching this fisherman pull his boat to the shore with the rope, you might mistakenly believe that the fisherman was pulling the shore to the boat. Now, because we understand physics, we know that the fisherman is pulling his boat to the shore. But if you didn't understand that, you might think he's pulling the shore to the boat. And the rabbi says, this is the mistake people make about prayer. They think of prayer as pulling God down to us, when in fact, the physics of prayer are about pulling ourselves closer to God. So when I pray during this terrible crisis that we're in, and perhaps when you pray, I offer this to you. This is an opportunity to ask myself questions. Who am I in this crisis? What am I in this crisis? What is godly about me that I need to manifest more of during this crisis? How can I pull myself closer to God? Uh, that, that's prayer. Uh, now, let's just also talk a little bit about uh, healing prayers. And I'm sending a video out to my congregation about this, uh, probably go out on Tuesday. Uh, when I pray uh, for people who are ill, I don't, I'm not praying for a cure. I, I'm, I call these prayers healing prayers, not curing prayers, because healing means coming to terms with the reality of disease. Healing means making peace with what cannot be changed. It's very different than praying for a miracle. And, and these healing prayers are also powerful because it really helps people to know you're praying for them. And it helps us to pray for people we love. So that's how I understand the whole concept. Uh, let me take a moment now to just welcome a few more people. Uh, Leanne, glad, glad you're here. Talia, so glad. Uh, Deborah, welcome. Alan. Karen, uh, so glad you're here. Thanks for everything you're doing. Adam, glad you're here. Um, and just one more mention, those of you aren't watching on other pages, you might want to migrate over to at Rabbi Steve Leader if you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question. And I'm going to ask for questions in a few minutes. Uh, let, me, let me move now to the next subject that I think might be useful to all of us. And that is to move forward in history a little bit, to move from the Bible forward to, you know, let's, let's go now to the early common era. Let's go back 2,000 years instead of 3,500 years. Uh, and let, let me review now a few, I think, very powerful insights from that period. Uh, some very powerful ideas by the Talmudic sages about darkness and what light can be seen in the midst of darkness. So first of all, the, the rabbis uh, observe that we actually see light through the darkest part of our eye. We see light through our pupil, the blackest part of the eye is what ultimately reveals light. I think this is a, a very powerful statement of faith that despite being in darkness, and this is a very dark time for all of us, despite being in darkness, we have faith that somehow light is being revealed. Uh, and again, that is not to dismiss the terror of the darkness. Yes, we're afraid, but it is to say, let us not only be afraid, Let's look and let's see and let's appreciate and let's count our blessings, even in the midst of this darkness. And there are so many. We've all seen on Instagram, on the news, on, on Facebook, Twitter, um, the incredible acts of human generosity, of spirit, um, of love, of compassion, of bravery. My God, the bravery of these doctors and these nurses and these first responders. We're all witnessing countless, countless examples of the very best within people. Uh, and, and we're seeing that through a dark time, through the black pupil of the eyes. The rabbis were right. 
And by the way, let's not idealize the good old days. They weren't so good. Let's remember that these rabbis, these Talmudic sages, Jesus himself, lived in a time of terrible disease and death and destruction and danger. They understood better than we what it means to see through the darkness. Um, I want to talk about uh, olive oil for a minute, as strange as that might seem, because the sages use olive oil as a metaphor. I think most of us know that olive oil was the fuel of lamps during the time uh, of the Bible and during the time of the first and second temples, so roughly 2,000 years ago. The rabbis give a lot of thought to why olive oil. And they, they see the whole thing as a metaphor, because how is it that an olive releases its oil? It releases its oil when it's crushed, when it's pressed, when it is stressed, when it is pushed on. This quarantine, this virus is pressing us. It's crushing. It's squeezing. I am uh, quarantined in a in a you know pretty good sized house, and I feel very very blessed. But even here, uh, with my wife and my son, we're feeling the walls closing in a little bit. It's pressing us. It's pushing us. I know I feel pushed by this uh, crisis in a way I've never been pushed before in my 33 years as a rabbi. I also know that in that pressing and pushing and stress. I am uh, finding things within me to share that I've never found before. I'm finding ways to lead that I've never found before. Uh, I'm, I'm entered the world of technology in a way I never did before. And I feel a little bit like an immigrant in this world, but here I am. All of us know that when we're pressed, it either brings out the best or the worst in us. And uh, from the view of the rabbis, this oppression was capable of bringing out the best. Of, of getting the oil uh, that burns brightly in the lamp. So I, I urge us all to find ways to, to embrace that metaphor when we feel so stressed and pressed that uh, we're gonna enable it to reveal something beautiful in us and the ability, it's gonna give us the ability to shed light. Now, uh, another, I think, very powerful idea is the way the Talmudic sages uh, remind us of the uh, nature of darkness being a beginning, not an end. Uh, you know, most people say, well, he was in the sunset of his life or we're sunsetting this idea, meaning it's an end. For the ancients, sunset was the beginning. Uh, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. Uh, the moon, not the sun, nighttime, not daytime, uh, is the beginning of a new day. Uh, when the sun sets is when the day begins for Jews. So it's, a, it's, I think, another way of the rabbis teaching us that darkness is actually leading to a beginning, not an end. We're about to begin a new month, uh, the, and the month in which Passover takes place. The new month begins when the moon is in its newest phase, when it's just a slender, slender sliver of light, just a tiny sliver in that big dark circle of the moon. And, and this is seen as a beautiful beginning, not an end. I'll also tell you something else I think that's very, very powerful. There's a whole discussion in the Talmud about the blessings around a new moon and who has to say those blessings and who does not. In fact, there's a whole discussion in the Talmud about who is obligated to say certain blessings and perform certain commandments and who is not. And people with certain disabilities are exempted. For example, in the time of the rabbis, a person who was deaf was exempted from the obligation to study because they were uh, believed to be unreachable and uh, incapable of study. That has since changed, thank goodness. Now here's the powerful point. According to the laws of the Talmud, a blind person, is nevertheless obligated to recite the blessing over the new moon. In other words, we are all called to affirm with faith things we cannot yet see, cannot even see, may not ever see. To me, this is a very powerful idea. 
that we are commanded to affirm what we cannot see. This is the essence of faith. It's easy to affirm what's right in front of us. It requires real faith, real faith to affirm the goodness and the decency and the blessings and the power and the beauty of life in the darkness. So I'm wishing us all that kind of faith and power. Uh, let's move on unless anyone has questions. Um, I'm just taking a second to look and, and see who else has joined us. Uh, oh, Pam, oh, Pam, thank you for being here. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, Lauren, glad, you're, glad you've joined me. Jill, welcome. Uh, Talia, hi again. Uh, thank you all. And just a reminder, those of you watching on other pages, if you want to comment or ask a question, just migrate over to my page at Rabbi Steve Leader. Um, if you're on Wilshire Boulevard Temple's page, Truly or Truly Espanol, uh, and you want to ask a question, come on over, um, and we'll we'll get to questions in a few minutes. Uh, just to review, we've we've sort of covered now how were people who were afflicted with a terrible disease treated in the time of the Bible. They were treated with great respect and dignity and never abandoned by the community, even when they had to be isolated and quarantined. We talked about ways uh, in which the Bible uses a, uh, something in which the Bible indicates that human beings are capable of using the same one thing for good or for evil purposes, and that this is an opportunity to use something for the good that could just as easily be used for the bad. We talked about prayer, the difference between a wish and a prayer. Um, and prayer being about changing us, not God or nature. Uh, we talked about how the rabbis, the Talmudic sages, saw darkness as an opportunity to see light. We see through the darkest part of our eye, we see light. And I'm going to make one more observation about that. And then we're going to move on to how we create by not creating, which I know sounds crazy, but trust me, it's not. Uh, one more, I think, powerful idea about this idea of darkness and light. And this is probably the most famous of all examples that I, I can share with you. And that's the 23rd Psalm. We all, we all know the 23rd Psalm. It is recited universally at uh, Christian and Jewish funerals. This is the Psalm that says, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. We all know the Psalm. And one of a couple of the reasons I mean we read it at, at funerals is obvious. First of all, it talks about death as this peaceful, everlasting existence uh, in the afterlife, you know, like like being in a green pasture by still waters. That's the obvious reason. But I think that there are two other very powerful ideas in this psalm that can really help us right now. I would read this psalm every day if I were you. I know I do. It all, they, these two powerful ideas have to do with the same one verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear. Two powerful ideas. First, yea, though I walk through the valley. In other words, we're not going to stay here forever, this dark valley. We're not going to be here forever. We're not going to be stuck like this forever. We're not going to be worried for our health and the health of people we love forever. We walk through the darkness. We put one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, one minute, one hour, one day at a time, with faith that we do get through this. That's the first important idea. The second and much more nuanced and subtle idea is this idea of shadow. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Let's think about a shadow for a moment. If you think deeply about a shadow, a shadow is actually, dark as it may be, it's proof of light. You cannot have a shadow unless there's a light shining behind it. Think of yourself in a valley of shadows, in this valley surrounded by mountains on each side, and you're in this shadow. The mountain is obstructing the light, but the light still shines. This, again, a powerful idea of faith, that we're in a dark time, 
but behind this darkness is still light that shines and we will walk through this valley into the light again. And I, I firmly and deeply believe that. We have all been through difficult things before. I know, I know almost all of you who are watching right now uh, on my page, I can see your names. I know so many of you. I know you have walked through a dark valley before and found your way back into the light again. We all have suffered. To be human is to suffer. This is not the first time and it won't be the last. And it is well worth remembering that we've all been through something crushing, oppressive, frightening, unknown before. And somehow we have found a way to survive it. So this will be no different. I believe that with all my heart and soul, and I wish you that, that kind of faith and belief. Now, um, let's move on. I want to move to another concept that I think will be uh, instructive and helpful, and you've probably already experienced it. And this is something that theologians call via negationis in English, by way of the negative. Uh, there's a whole school of theology called negative theology, which simply put means we can understand what God is by understanding what God is not. In other words, take away all the bad ideas and it leaves behind a good idea that you can actually create by removing rather than adding. The best metaphor for this is that of a sculpture. Every beautiful marble sculpture started out as a single big block of marble. And the beautiful sculpture was created by the artist chipping away, taking away, removing everything that wasn't beautiful. The, the statue was always in that marble. It just took an artist to remove everything that wasn't beautiful. This is particularly true of the Sabbath, by the way. So much of the Sabbath, so much of Shabbat is not about the thou shalt. There are very few thou shalt, positive commandments. Most of the Sabbath is about thou shalt nots, the things we are not allowed to do. Because when you remove those things from your life, something very beautiful is revealed. I thought about this on my walk yesterday. Yesterday I was walking uh, in my neighborhood and there were parents out pushing strollers. Uh, there were people out walking their dogs. There were neighbors I've seen for years, didn't know their names. And I introduced myself from six feet away, of course. Hey, I'm Steve. How are you doing? Hi, I'm Judy. How are you? Doing fine. Aren't we lucky to be out in this beautiful day? I haven't taken a walk in my neighborhood in the middle of the day for years. And now here I am. I, I, like you, I'm sure, are reaching out to people I haven't reached out to in years. People are reaching out to me who haven't reached out in years. I'm hunkered down with my family, and yeah, it's a little oppressive. We get on each other's nerves a little bit, but we're also laughing together and cooking together and playing together, and we're sharing our fears with each other in very, very beautiful ways. Uh, it is amazing when you remove the materialism of Instagram and social media, and you remove the gossip component of Instagram and social media, it starts to be used to share inspiration, to share poetry, to share music, to share beautiful photographs. It's amazing what this virus has stripped away and removed. Uh, I, I got to hit cancel, 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 cancel on so many meetings last week and this week that were scheduled. And it's made me think more deeply about my time. Have I, have I really been using my time for the people and the things that matter most? This is all this idea of creating via negationis, that something beautiful emerges when we stop doing certain things. It's one of the great blessings of this virus. The question is, when it's all over, and it will be over, are we going to revert back to our default setting of the hurry and the scurry of our previous lives? Or are we going to really learn something from this hell we're all walking through? Are we going to come out of this hell something other than empty-handed? 
and and I sure I sure hope so. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to answer a question now, and then uh, I have uh, one more thing I want to talk about after I answer some questions, which is I want to move into the modern period and. What are a couple things that I can share with you uh, that are more modern, more contemporary, that might be helpful in this in this crazy time? So this is a. Uh, uh, let me just take a second here. Um, what a couple of questions. Uh, Talia says yes, yes. Self awareness heightened, self seeking slips away. We are truly all in this together. Need to work together. Very true. Uh, everything is more vivid right now in a way. Uh, and, and Talia, thank you for that. So here, a uh, question from Janet. So we're not to pray to God to cure someone, but can we ask God to heal someone? Yes, exactly. That's an important distinction. I don't really believe there's such a thing as a curing prayer, but what does healing mean? Now, let me get a little bit deeper on this in terms of the psycholinguistics of Hebrew. In Hebrew, when we wish someone uh, healing, we wish them refuah shlema, complete healing. Shlema, you may be thinking, sounds a lot like shalom. And you're thinking that because they all come from the same root. So complete. Shalom does not mean hello, only hello and goodbye. It also means whole, W-H-O-L-E. Shalom means wholeness. That's the deepest kind of peace is a sense of wholeness, to be at one, to be one. And so when we pray for healing, refua shlema, complete healing, we're not playing, praying for complete curing. We're praying for healing. And what is healing? Uh, healing is, is becoming at one with the reality of, you, of, of your situation, of the world of your own spiritual body and being. I'll give you a very real example from my own life. Uh, my father was diagnosed when he was 75 years old with Alzheimer's. I said a healing prayer for my father every day, every day, knowing full well he was only going to get worse. Alzheimer's is a one-way street. There is no cure and he was never going to get better. Every day he got a little worse, but I still said this prayer for him. Because what I the kind of healing I was praying for was for him to be at peace with his new reality, his new normal, and for my family to heal in a way that would enable us to care for him, and for me to heal as his son, for me to find a way to become at peace with what I could not change, with what no one could change, with what was inevitable. That's prayer. That's meaningful. That's helpful. That's what it means to be prayerful. Uh, and, and I hope that's a, a more complete answer, Janet, to your uh, to your question. Uh, Gail, welcome. Uh, okay, now um, I want to move on to the last little bit that I've prepared uh, for all of you today, and that is modernity. What 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 is there uh, that's helping me in this moment, and that I think might help you? And in a word, it's perspective. I hope I've already provided some perspective that we are not the first people in human history to suffer uh, this kind of fear, to suffer this isolation, uh, to be confronted with darkness and the challenge to somehow see light within it. We're not the first. We won't be the last. And I, and I hope I made the point that all of us in our own individual lives have already walked through some kind of valley of shadows back into the light. And we will do that again. By the way, I want to add, none of this is easy. And no one, no one suffers pain better alone. This is the opportunity of opportunities to reach out. The Talmud says, the prisoner cannot free himself. The prisoner cannot free himself. We have to reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out to me. Reach out to your family, reach out to your friends, reach out to the people who love you. They don't mind uh, any more than you mind being reached out to during this crisis. So reach out. The prisoner cannot free himself. Now, 
I, I want to share with you a couple of things that have helped keep me a little bit more sane and given me some perspective during uh, the past few days. Um, and then I'll get to a few more questions, and then I'm going to close with a couple of uh, readings and a joke. Uh, I've decided to close all my all my outreach and all my Zoom meetings and Google Hangout meetings. I'm ending every conversation with a joke now because laughter is so important. Laughter means we're deciding to survive. Um, there were jokes even in Auschwitz. So, and this is far from Auschwitz, uh, which leads me to my first point about perspective. When you feel the walls closing in around you, when I feel them closing in around me, uh, I remember that Anne Frank, Anne Frank spent 700, more than 700 days in a 450 square foot attic with seven other people hiding from the Nazis. And most of that time was spent in complete silence so as to be undetected. And then ultimately ended up in ash in a chimney in Auschwitz. So when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I think about Anne Frank and I, I remind myself about the difference between a problem and an inconvenience. Anne Frank had a problem. You and I, we have an inconvenience. You know, uh, the grocery store being out of this or that is an inconvenience. When you're searching in a dumpster for a bite to eat of spoiled food, that's a problem. Those of us who, you know, uh, are are stuck at home, we we have we have a inconvenience. The people in ICU on a respirator, people love them. That's a problem. Uh, Robert Fulgham, the Unitarian minister, said, "A lump in the oatmeal and a lump in the breast are not the same breast." So let's all keep in mind and Frank, and let's remember the difference between a problem and an inconvenience. Right now, most of us are merely inconvenienced. Let's count our blessings. The next thing that has, you know, helped me quite a bit. Sorry, I had to go off camera to pick this up. The next thing that's helped me quite a bit that I want to share with all of you, um, and then I'm going to take questions and then I'm going to close is something that was written in 1948. Remember, 1948 was just three years after the war ended. And this was written by C.S. Lewis in 1948. I'm going to read it to all of you. It's called On Living in an Atomic Age. Of course, this was written in the aftermath of the realization of the power of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So humanity uh, was living in fear of this new science and its power, and the Cold War was, was really just beginning. C.S. Lewis, 1948, on living in an atomic age. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I am tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. Or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, in an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, and we still have that. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. 
And the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible human things, praying, working, touching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies. A microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. On Living in an Atomic Age, C.S. Lewis, 1948. Again, the power of perspective. Uh, now I'm going to take a couple questions, and then I'm going to wrap up with a final reading and a joke, which I promised everyone. So let me take a look. Um, okay, uh, my friend Lauren is asking, how can we impart this opportunity onto our kids who just use it for more screen time, video games, and not embracing this amazing time to be together and different things? Well, look. Uh, there's an old joke, Heinrich Heine, I think, was the first to make it, that uh, he said the Jews are like everyone else, just more so, um, which Jews understand very well. This crisis is not going to give your kids a new personality, Lauren, and it's not going to give any of us a new personality. This crisis makes everyone more so. If kids tended to isolate before and bury themselves in their screens, they're going to want to do that even more so. Uh, if, if you are a pessimist, you're going to be more pessimistic. If you're an optimist, you're going to be more optimistic. Everyone is more so. So I think, Lauren, first of all, part of this is just letting kids be kids and letting them deal with the stress and anxiety um, in the way that they know how to. That being said, I do think that you can carve out specific times. Like tomorrow night is game night. Uh, every morning, we're going to take a walk for half an hour. We're going to exercise for half an hour. Uh, we're going to watch this funny video for half an hour together. Uh, you, we're going to each share a joke, you know, at dinner every night and spend time searching for our jokes. I think you can set aside some sacred times, but I also think you have to let your kids do what is appropriate for kids their age to be doing. Uh, you know, being teenagers, which I know your kids are, is all about differentiating, pulling away, experimenting with their own things in their own ways. And you, you've got to allow for some of that. Uh, this is not a time to expect anyone, including our own children, to have a new personality. Uh, I, wish, I wish we could just give people the personalities we'd like them to have, but believe me, I know that's not possible. Um, I want to share something that Lauren, hi Lauren, so glad you're with us, um, that that she's sharing. Uh, this is my, my friend, Lauren Rosenblum, whose dad is an oncologist. And she's talking about the importance of sharing with her dad the difference between a problem and inconvenience while he's forced to work from home, because this is so frustrating for older doctors who basically, you know, really are at such risk that they can't, they can't be seeing patients. Um, and, and Lauren, you're right. I think this is an opportunity for all of us to get some perspective on the difference between a problem and an inconvenience. And uh, it's, it's, it's so crucial, uh, you know, and, and I, tr I try to use this long before, long before this crisis. You know, any of us stuck on the freeway because there's a car accident and are expressing all this frustration, we've all done that in the past. Stop and think for a moment about the person in the accident, the person whose back is broken, whose neck is broken, you know, whose skull is, is fractured, who was in that accident. That's a problem. You have an inconvenience. And knowing the difference is going to make going through this valley of shadows an awful lot easier. Um, uh, Gary, Gary is asking, how do we handle living alone? Uh, my dog is not much of a conversationalist. <laughs> um, yes, Gary, I, I am personally reaching out to many in the temple. Actually, we're calling everyone we, we can think of. Um, we're starting with 
80s to 90s, then this week we're going 70s to 80s, then we're going 60s to 70s, et cetera, all the way down until everyone is called. Look, I think the strategy has to be more so. Whatever you did before living alone to stay connected, um, other than physically being close to people, you've got to do. You have to reach out. The prisoner cannot free himself. Uh, call, FaceTime, email, call, FaceTime, email, call people and ask uh, neighbors and say, let's stay six feet away from each other and go for a walk. I um, FaceTime our friends in Italy who feel, if you think we <laughs> have a problem, they really have a problem. Uh, I, we FaceTime our friends in Italy. Um, you've, you've just got to keep reaching out and also understand that this is temporary. A lot of people think it's, a, it's, it's Jewish, but it's not. It's actually a Persian folktale. This notion of all things, this too shall pass. Um, it's a Persian folktale. A Persian king asked his wise men to create a ring for him that had a phrase inscribed on it, engraved in it, that would help him when in happy times and help him in sad times. And the phrase that the wise men come up with is, this too shall pass. So Gary, uh, this isolation is, is very difficult. I can promise you it will pass and, and we'll be out into the light and, and be able to hug and hold and, and be with people again. But right now, you have to reach out in every possible way you can uh, that doesn't involve endangering yourself or others. Um, Lisa's asking, how do I show this particular episode to my folks who aren't on social media? I don't know the answer to that question, but if you send me an email with that question so that I remind to, to get the answer to you, Lisa, I, I'll get it to you. Uh, Lori, Lori's asking, can you speak to us living alone? Same thing in the cold weather where it's not easy to walk outside. <laughs> Lori, you and I, we're from St. Louis Park, Minnesota. We know about the cold. Uh, I still think you should go outside a little bit. Uh, even if it's really cold, <clears throat> I remember as a little kid playing playing in cold that I wouldn't even consider playing outside in today, but I still think it's important to be outside for a little bit. Uh, it's important to be in the sunshine and uh, to exercise, of course, at home. Uh, the mind-body connection I don't think has ever been more apparent to people than it is right now. Um, and and I, I want to say a word since there are a lot of questions. Um, about essentially anxiety. Um, um, oh, I have an answer to Lisa's question about how her parents who aren't on social media can do this. Our head of technology, Don Levy, is saying it'll be post, it has been posted at wbtla.org forward slash WBTA, w, WBT at home. So it'll be on our website, Lisa. Um, now, as uh, as promised, yes, people can rewatch Gail. It'll be on the Temple's website. Now, um, it'll also be on my Facebook page as a video, and I'll have my, my friend Noreen, uh, Maureen's gonna download this and put it on my website. So this will be a lot of places where people can find it. Now, as promised, I wanna be sensitive to everyone's time. We've been on almost an hour. Uh, I wanna share one, uh, one reading with you, and then, to conclude, and, and I want to tell you my joke, okay? Because as I said, I'm ending every conversation with a joke now, because man, we need it. Um, so the first thing is I, I want to read something to you. I know this seems a little bit like enlightened self-interest, but really my very best thinking about this whole topic of suffering and pain and finding ways to find meaning within it and transcend it uh, is is in my book, More more Beautiful Than Before. Uh, let me see. There it is. More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us. Uh, this, this is really my best thinking about this entire topic is in this book, and, and it's my way of being able to share it with all of you. So I hope if you don't have it, you'll find a way to just, you know, download it or uh, on your Kindle or Audible or, or get a copy and Amazon will get it to you within a few days. And I want to read from, from my book, More Beautiful Than Before, um, to hopefully help you. Help you um, and here it is. 
and, and then I promise to conclude with a joke. The pain does lessen. Our eyes do stop weeping. Like a watercolor wash, time does soften our suffering. We laugh again. We enjoy our work, our family, our friends. We move on because we know we must. Otherwise, our time here is wasted. Believe me, I am not campaigning for it, nor does the job exist. But if there was such a job as chief rabbi of those who suffer, and I held that job, here is what I would say to the victims of pain. I would remind them that life is long, long enough to start again, to rebuild, to take more pictures, to create more memories, to heal. I would remind them that the day begins at midnight, the darkest hour, because it helps to live with faith that darkness will somehow be followed by light. I would remind them that hope begins when the moon is new, in its darkest phase, just a slim crescent of light against the black sky. And I would remind them that faith in that which we cannot see through our tears is the truest faith of all. Have faith that the moon will soon enough be full, reflecting the sun's great power for warmth and light. Believe that there is a time for everything, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to remember that there is time enough to heal. Albert Camus put it this way, in the depths of winter, I finally learned that within me there lay an invincible summer. More beautiful than before, how suffering transforms us. Uh, Dostoevsky said his greatest fear was that his life would not be worthy of his suffering. Let us all live in ways that make us worthy, worthy of this difficulty and pain. Okay, I'm going to conclude with a joke, uh, as I promised. All right, here we go. A rabbi, a priest, and an imam walk into a bar. The bartender looks up and he says, hey, what is this, a joke? That's my joke. <laughs> Thank you all for being with me today. Uh, I promise to do more of these. We'll let you know when. Share this with your friends. Hunker down with the people you love. Um, if, if, you're, if you're quarantined alone, reach out, reach out, reach out. And, and all of you, please, please email me, Facebook message me, meet me on Instagram. Um, I, I really, really sincerely want to help in every, every possible way that I can. Um, God bless everyone. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.